Okay, Steve, the word of God is alive and powerful. Than any two edged sword, piercing, dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, and the joints and the marrow, and the critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God breathed. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may become mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself proved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. We're going to take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through the technique of rebounds. And Steve will uh, close out our prayer time and we'll pick up our study right where we left off. Father, we come to you this evening and ask your blessing upon what is taught here today. The word of God is so powerful, so important in our lives, and especially in the magnified intensity of the times we live in today. We need it. We live by it. We just pray all this taught here in this ministry will have a great ripple effect in teaching us the mechanics of the Christian way of life and help us see that big picture of that puzzle. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just give me just a moment, folks. Okay, uh, getting people notices from people on Facebook right now indicating that they don't have a notification for the meeting, but I'm, but Facebook's got a problem, so there's not, not, nothing that I can do. Okay, let's do this. Um, we are going to be studying Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, if we get to it. And it's very possible that we will not, but if we do, we'll get uh, to it as much as possible. What I want to do tonight, since we're dealing with this idea of circumcision, this is a subject that I don't believe that many pastors, for whatever reason, and, and it would be up to them, that many pastors don't talk about because it, it generally comes up in relationship with something in the Old Testament. And Paul is dealing with the Philippians about this very this very issue, and so I, uh, I felt like it was essential that we teach the doctrine of circumcision. And really, in teaching that doctrine, what I've taught thus far, I've only taught about three pages of about about sixteen pages of, of information. But some of it's historical; and it's not uh, it's not pertinent to what we're dealing with right here. So I wanted to talk about uh, the circumcision as it related to the Christian way of life. Well, let's do this then. This coming Sunday, if you're going to be able to be with me on an American Pie, please let me know for seating arrangements and also uh, sufficient notes. Now let's move to our let's move to our document, and here's where we're going to start. We're talking about circumcision. We've seen that in verse two. We're seeing it in verse 3, and Paul's going to tell us in verse 3 that we are the true circumcision. And the word true is actually uh, italicized in the sense that in the English it's italicized because it doesn't really exist in the Greek text, but it's, it, it's implied in the text so that when you're translating from Greek to English, uh, it's okay to put that word true in there but you italicize it to make sure you let the folks know that this is an addition to the Greek text. Now, with that in mind, let's, um, let's begin then in what I call point one here. God made a covenant with Abraham in the Old Testament. In Genesis 12:1, that, uh, that covenant was expressed. And here's what Genesis 12:1 and following say. Now, the Lord said to Abram, now, first of all, make sure you see that his name is Abram now. It's not Abraham. His name is Abram. We'll deal with that in just a moment. It says, go out from your country. Now, this is where he was living at the point in time. He was living with family. God says to go out from your country and from your relatives. So here is Abraham and uh, Abram living in a particular location, and God's saying, okay, pack up and get out of here, okay, and leave your relatives back here and depart from your father's house. Then he's, you're, you're going to go from there, but where are you going to go to? He says, go to a land, go to the land, which I will show you. See, he doesn't know where it is yet. 
He says, go to a land which I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation. This is a pretty pretty, uh, lofty promise that's coming from God. And remember again, we're dealing with Abram's life in the angelic conflict. And at this point in time, the only the only um, group of people that uh, that are uh, on planet Earth are Gentiles. Gentiles is all we have, okay? And Abraham is a Gentile at this point in time. So he says, "Get out of this land, and I'm going to take you to a plan a land that I'm going to show you." Then in verse two, he said, "And I will make you into a great nation." That's going to be interesting because at the time Abraham is 90, 100 years old and Sarah is 99, 90, 90 years old, neither one of them are capable of bearing children. So that's what's, that's, this is what's happening here. So he says, and I'll make a great nation of you, and I will, I will bless you and make your name great, and you blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. In you, all of the families of the earth will be blessed, okay? So that's the covenant, the initial covenant that God made with Abram. Get out of this land and go to the land that I'm going to show you. Now, we, we move on to the next phase of Abraham's life. And what I'm going to, I'm going to talk about here is the fact that Abraham is going to be circumcised. So let's take a look at this. He's going to be circumcised. And Genesis, this is found in Genesis 24 through 26. And here's what he and here's what he tells them. He says, Now Abram Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised. Okay, he's 99 years old when he's circumcised, okay. He was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. I'm sure that you know what that means. Then he says in verse 25, and his son Ishmael, now this is his son now. His son Ishmael was 13 years old. And he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Now notice here again, Abram is, 90, is 99 years old and his son's only 13. So by at this point in time, there's still he and Sarah are still or he 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 is still capable of bearing bearing children. Okay, so he circumcised uh, circumcises Ishmael here, and on this very same day, Abraham was circumcised as well as his son Ishmael. So these two were circumcised on the same day. I want to make a comment here: Ishmael's circumcision had no significance in stop. This is important to you. Ishmael is of the seed of Abraham. He has the genetic structure of Abraham. He is going to be he is going to be circumcised just like Abraham is and he's being circumcised because God told Abraham circumcise your son and we're going to find out that every male child out of, out of his lineage, lineage needs to be circumcised. Now, a bullet point here, Ishmael's circumcision had no significant significance in relationship to the covenant. Now, here's the issue. God made a covenant with Abraham. But there's going to be something wrong here with Ishmael that doesn't let him get in on this, okay? Just keep that in mind. Bullet point says Ishmael's circumcision was a, had no significance in relationship to the covenant. Genesis 17, 25 Ishmael's circumcision was a case of ritual without reality. And what we're going to have to do is as we're putting this puzzle together in of uh, and how this relates to the Christian way of life, you need to realize that while some of these people are being circumcised and that circumcision is supposed to mean something, it's it uh, there's a, a truth related to that. There are some of these people that are circumcised that has an absolutely no value to, and what we want to do is find out what did they do or what didn't they do to allow them to get in on this covenant relationship. Because God made the covenant with with, uh, uh, with Abraham, but uh, uh, the issue is Ishmael was born not to Sarah but to another woman. Okay, so what is then if circumcision is important to us? Then what is what is circumcision? 
I got something on the left. There we go. Okay. What is circumcision? And this is this is important for us to understand. And when we go, when we go down through this and expand this idea of an understanding of circumcision, we're going to learn that circumcision is this, but we're going to find out that circumcision also has a, another meaning, has another meaning. So it's got a larger meaning than just any one statement that we're making here. But here's one thing about circumcision. Circumcision is the ritual of confirmation and acknowledgement of God's covenant with Abraham is a, and it's an unconditional covenant. Now, let me point out what this means. An unconditional covenant. You've got two different kinds of covenants. One's unconditional and the other's conditional. A conditional covenant goes like this. I'm going to make a covenant with you. If you will do this, I will do that. That's conditional. You're receiving the benefit of the covenant is based upon you doing something. But an unconditional covenant is God says, this is the way it's going to be. Nothing ever will ever change it. I don't care if you're like, whatever. That, no, I'm making the covenant. This is what's going to happen. So that's an unconditional covenant. Now, circumcision then is the ritual of confirmation. So when, you, when the males were circumcised, what this was doing, this was confirming something and acknowledging something. And what it was confirming and acknowledging was God's covenant that God made with Abraham. So God says to Abraham, I'm going to bless you and all of your descendants. So three generations from now, some male gets, he's circumcised and says, what are you doing that? He said, God, my, God made a, God made a, uh, uh, a covenant with my great grandfather back here. And he said that the covenant was not only going to be good for him, but it's going to be good for us down here if we are circumcised and we're circumcising ourselves to, to give confirmation and acknowledgement of that unconditional covenant with Abraham. Now, that, uh, that truth then is found in uh, Genesis 17, 9 through 14 and Romans 4 through 18. And I thought if you wanted to, you can read those passages on your own, but I didn't want to spend the time reading the, those lengthy passages like that because of the amount of information that we have in our notes tonight. So circumstance, circumcision, we're going to talk about three things. Circumcision in Israel is a reminder that God keeps his word. Remember, unconditional covenant. God is going to bless people. He's the land. And isn't amazing that even today there's a misunderstanding and there, there are arguments about who owns this land. Okay. But we know this, that God gave this land to Israel and gave it to them unconditionally. So it's theirs no matter what people are trying to make out of it. Secondly, circumcision means that any Jew who Christ will be the recipient of this covenant forever. Now stop right here, Marshall. This says circumcision means that any Jew who believes in Christ will be the recipient of this covenant forever. Question. If if the if all of the male children who are descendants of Abraham need to be circumcised, that indicates we, we acknowledge and confirm this covenant that God made with my my ancestor back here. So this male, twenty generations later, um, gets circumcised, but the truth of the matter is he never believes in Christ. So what happens is circumcision is is of no value to him. It's it's uh, it's um, it's it's lacking the reality of what the circumcision is supposed to be. So circumcision in, in illustrates the faith rest. Uh, this third point, circumcision illustrates the faith rest drill and Abraham's dependence upon the omnipotence and faithfulness of God. God told him, "This is what I'm going to do." Well, Abraham could have believed him or disbelieved him. But if Abraham believes him, guess what? That's faith rest. He has faith in what God promised, and he's resting in that, believing that it will actually become true. So we call that the faith rest drill. So circumcision illustrates that Abraham is actually using the faith rest drill and depending upon the omnipotence of God, the power to do this, and his faithfulness and willingness to fulfill that, okay? Now let's talk about let's talk about the practice of circumcision. 
It's important to keep in mind that the practice of circumcision signified the covenantal relationship. Watch this. It, it, the practice of circumcision signified the covenantal relationship. So anytime a male got circumcised, what they're doing is they're, they're signifying that we believe that God made this arrangement with our ancestor Abraham. So it signified the covenantal relationship between the God of Israel and Abraham and his descendants. God instituted the practice of circumcision as a reminder to Israel that they owned their, own, their very own existence to him. They owed their very own existence to him. Okay? Now, I thought it was interesting, and I, didn't, I made a comment about this, uh, I think, on Sunday morning, and I'm going to make it again. It wasn't in the notes, but it just sort of a, was an interesting statement. And that is when you when a ma when a Jewish man who was who understood that God made this covenant with Abraham, who was his ancestor, every time a man urinated, it was a reminder to him that God made this covenant. And now, now, please, now, I don't think when I, I see puzzled looks on some of your faces. You understand what happens when a male has to urinate, don't they? Don't you? He has to, he has to he has to handle his own his own apparatus to be able to do this. So every time he every time he urinates and is handling his male apparatus, he's reminded of the fact that God made a covenant with his ancestor because he's looking at his own instrument. You got that? And it's it happens to be circumcised. So when he sees that circumcision, it's a constant reminder that God made this covenantal relationship with his ancestor. Now, God instituted the practice of circumcision as a reminder to Israel that they owe their very existence to him. You know, what he's going to he's going to protect them he's going to make make arrangements for them now understand in this next point that there are two types of jews now what we're doing here is it's sort of like we're taking a, a puzzle and putting it together and what when we get done we're going to see this great big picture and very clear painting of what circumcision means but in order to understand circumcision you have to understand these we're making god makes a cover him Abraham is circumcised. What is circumcision? The find out that there are two different types of Jews. This is important for you today to understand as a Christian. There are two types of Jews. First, there is the Jew who is the physical descendant of Abraham. And what does that mean? That means when you look at your own gene, when you're doing your genealogy, what you're doing is you're tracing your lineage back into, into the past. And what's happening here is that there is the Jew who is a is the physical descendant of Abraham. That means Abraham way back there, and forty generations later, hundred generations later, you look back, you you see you're 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 descending from Abraham. So there is the Jew who is the physical descendant of Abraham, and that is a Jew with the genetic structure of Abraham. It's a Jew with a genetic structure of Abraham. That means they have the genes of Abraham. Now, the second type of Jew is this. There is the circumcised Jew who believes in Jesus. Now, watch this. Do you understand that it's possible? It, it is possible that a, a male descendant of Abraham might not be circumcised. Either someone didn't believe it, the parents didn't believe it, and they uh, they didn't want to hurt the child. They were told, "Don't do this." It's very possible that a child who had the genetic structure of Abraham would not be circumcised. Now, let's take this. It's possible to be circumcised and not believe in Jesus Christ. Okay, so there are two different types of Jews. There was the Jew who had the genetic structure of Abraham. That Jew was circumcised. But then there were Jews who were circumcised who even Jesus. Do you know the name of one? How about Paul? You see, this is what Paul, Paul was a Jew. He was circumcised. But he wasn't a believer in Jesus Christ when he was on his road to Damascus, okay? And every all the years of his life prior to that. 
So two different kinds of Jews. One Jew has the genetic structure. The other Jew has the genetic structure, but believes in Jesus Christ. Okay. All right. Now let's review some terms. And th when, when I, you know, as you're reading down through this and you're, you're trying to study this, and you see these terms, if you don't know what they mean, it's very possible that you're going to miss the intent of what you're being taught in that passage of Scripture. First of all, there is a ritual circumcision. In other words, it's just, it's just the process of circumcising someone, okay? Ritual circumcision is simply the removal of foreskin. So when you, now, now this, now please understand this. Gentile males today, perhaps most males are, gen, uh, are circumcised. Generally speaking, they ask if you want to circumcise your son when you're in the hospital. I, maybe, maybe, I don't know whether they even give you a choice anymore. But early, they gave you a choice. Do you want your son circumcised? And if they did, they would circumcise that boy before he left the, before he left the hospital. But what you need to realize is the Bible says you're going to circumcise him, circumcise him on the eighth day. And there's a reason for that. It's because on the eighth day, the blood of that baby begins to coagulate. If you circumcise him prior to that time, there is a bleeding process problem. So what happens is you, you inject the child right after he's born, after the child's born, which gives him the capacity then to be circumcised, say, on the second day or third day before they leave the hospital, and you'll have to wait the eight days. But biblically, you're supposed to circumcise the male child on the eighth day. So ritual circumcision is simply the process of going through the, uh, the, um, the function of circumcising. But remember, this circumcision, this circumcision had a relationship to a covenant that God made with Abraham, when you and I are circumcised, I'm circumcised, uh, most males that I know are circumcised, and many of the males who are not circumcised by the, when they're born end up getting circumcised because of, the, because of the, uh, the, the problems they have in that area of their physical body because they're not circumcised. And I'll tell you, I've seen some of the, some of the worst kind of situations in a male because they weren't circumcised it's unbelievable. I can talk about that privately to you, but uh, nevertheless, cir ritual circumcision is the removal of the foreskin, and we're dealing with Jews, not, not you and I today. Now, the second type term we need to understand is spiritual And spiritual circumcision is accomplished by metabolizing doctrine, because what you're doing, you're circumcising your heart, and that term's coming up. So spiritual circumcision is accomplished by metabolizing doctrine because what you're doing is you're circumcising your heart. You're, you're, you're cutting out. See, circumcision means to cut. So what you're doing is you're cutting out. Well, what are you cutting out of? What are you cutting out of your right lobe? What are you cutting out in order to be a spiritual person? What are you going to, what, what is in, what is in your right lobe that uh, what kind of a viewpoints in your right lobe before you become born again and what human viewpoint. So what happens when you're circumcising your heart, what you're going to do is get rid of the old viewpoint. But if you're going to get rid of the old viewpoint, what are you going to replace it with? Divine viewpoint, the word of God. So th the process of metabolizing the word of God is the process of circumcising your right lobe circumcising your heart. So what happened is in the Jewish in the Jewish situation and we're going to make an application of the Christian way of life, but in the Jewish situation you could get you could get a physical circumcision and it was a ritual, but if you wanted the reality, you had to you had to circumcise your heart, which is a spiritual circumcision. So we have a ritual circumcision and a spiritual circumcision. Do you understand that you could have a physical circumcision without a spiritual circumcision? See, and that's where the Jews were. Many times when they went out under the fifth cycle of discipline, they went under the fifth cycle of discipline because they were disobedient. They didn't have the word. They didn't have the word of God. They weren't being obedient. So they had the physical, they had the physical circumcision, which was, it was ritual without reality. 
But the Jew who had who had the circumcision, they were the circumcision said, okay, we recognize that we have a covenant with God. I am a Jew. I am a part of this new racial new racial species here. But I've got a choice. Am I going to circumcise my heart and be blessed? Or am I just going to walk through life with this wonderful circumcision here, knowing that I'm a Jew? And this was their problem. Those who didn't have doctrine became arrogant. They thought they were they were the elite, the elite core of the human race. So we have a ritual circumcision and a spiritual circumcision, and then we have what is taught, uh, called and referred to as the reality of the circumcision. Okay. So the reality of the circumcision is when you have the you when you circumcise your right lobe, but the reality of the circumcision, the reality of the circumcision comes in three adjustments to the righteousness of God. Now I want you to stop and think about this because these are three fantastic statements when you understand what happens. The Jew needed to adjust to the righteousness of God. When the child is born, he got an old sin nature and he's separated from God. So somewhere along the line, and you you want to turn it down a little more? Yeah. The, uh, so what happens is the Jew has to become a born-again believer. And so they've got to learn that Jesus is the Messiah, and that's what they're learning every time they go through their, their, uh, their religious ritual and their format. They should be understanding this is trying to tell me that I have a Messiah and his name is Jesus. And he's if I believe in him, I'll have eternal life and I'll get in on this covenant. So you could have a ritual circumcision and miss the whole deal. And the reason for that is three adjustments to God's righteousness. And here it is. The first adjustment is salvation. But it's salvation through Christ. So you could have the ritual circumcision and go to hell. Because the first adjustment that you had to make was to believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Today, you and I need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for our sins on the cross. And when you have faith alone in Christ alone, who died, was buried, and resurrected, there is eternal salvation for you. You couldn't miss salvation. You couldn't miss heaven if you wanted to. So the first adjustment that the Jew had to make was the salvation adjustment. But that wasn't at all. The next thing they had to do was to to make sure it was operation recovery. When they sinned, they had to make a sacrifice, okay? So they had to recover their, they had to recover their status, get back into obedience with God, and align themselves with the Word of God. Otherwise, they have no fellowship with God. They're walking around with this circumcision, this elite idea of who we are, and they're headed for hell. They're out of fellowship with God, and God has beaten the stew out of them, by the Chaldeans and everybody else, because you're not you're not doing what I you're not being obedient to the word. Okay, so they had to have a form of operation recovery to stay in fellowship. So what they're going to do, Steve? That first of all, they have to have salvation, but salvation is not enough. You have to have fellowship after you're saved. But if you're out of fellowship with God, you're still in the same old boat. You're not where you need to be. So they had to make that adjustment to the righteousness of God. And they would do that through the sacrifice. You and I do this through Operation Recovery. And the third adjustment they had to make was the metabolization and application of doctrine to reach spiritual maturity. So the idea is this. If the Jew wasn't saved, or if the Jew was saved and was out of fellowship, or the Jew was saved and in fellowship but wasn't getting any doctrine, guess what? It's bad news. You follow that? So the reality of the circumcision means then so what happens it's not just enough cody to get circumcised they have to be in fellowship with god have to be obedient they have to be applying the word of god to the circumstance of life now you have the reality of the circumcision so it's not just circumcision alone it's just not circumcision and salvation it's circumcision and obedience to the word of god to be to have to have the reality of what circumcision really really meant now, in point four, we had ritual circumcision, spiritual circumcision, reality of circumcision, and now we have new racial species. Well, what was the new racial species? It's descendants of Abraham who are circumcised. So this is the new racial species. Prior to the time that Abraham was, uh, prior to the time that Abraham was circumcised, how many how many types of people did we have on planet Earth? G word. 
just one. What were they? Gentiles. And when, when Abraham was circumcised, he became a Jew at that point in time by God's pronouncement. Now you have a new racial species, Jew and Gentile, okay? Prior to the circumcision, the entire human race was classified as Gentiles. That's sub point one. After Abraham's circumcision, there were Gentiles and Jews, a new spiritual, a new race. It's a new racial species. I want to make sure I, 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 I think that for whatever reason, my, my head, I'm thinking one thing and saying another. It's a new racial species, not spiritual species. It's a new racial species. So it's Gentiles. Now you have one Jew. And every time uh, Abraham was, they had children. That was de that descendant then when circumcised became a became a Jew. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about some information about Abraham. Abraham was born a Gentile. Was that Abram? Yes, he was. It, it's, that's right. It's it's Abram was born a Gentile. But when later. He became Abraham. Abraham's original name was Abram, which meant, meant exalted father. Abram meant exalted father. When he was, when God changed his name from Abram to Abraham, Abraham means a father of a multitude. And that's exactly what God told him he'd do. I said, I'll make you a, um, the father of many nations. Sub point four there, Abraham became circumcised at God's command. Now, Bullet point, at the moment of Abraham's circumcision, he became a new species. He became a Jew. He was a Gentile, but now he is a Jew by reason of his circumcision. Then after, after he became a Jew with his circumcision, Abraham actually became spiritually saved. <clears throat> and <clears throat> someone might say, <clears throat> today, for example, Marshall, if I say, you well um he was saved about three weeks ago and i say what do you think i meant he said well you know he believed in jesus and i say well no that's not what i was talking about i was talking about him being out in the woods and he's being chased by a bear and the bear fell down and fell off the cliff and uh, and this guy got saved so it's a there's a spiritual salvation and there's a physical salvation and while many people, when you talk about saved, they think they think spiritual salvation because they don't ever think of being saved out of a uh, out of a uh, disastrous kind of a circumstance. So, in order to make sure you understand, or anybody who reads this understands, we're talking about spiritual salvation. Okay, so Abraham, after he was circumcised, then he actually became spiritually saved under a new set of circumstances. He was circumcised first, and then he became saved later. Now, let me point out something, Steve, <clears throat> as a chaplain and a teacher of the Word of God. There's a lot of controversy about this because many would actually indicate that actually that he actually was saved back in uh, when he left the land of the Earth of the Chaldees, okay? But that doesn't seem to be the case, and I'm not teaching that. I'm, not, I'm teaching that even after his circumcision, he didn't get saved until he was um, until he um, believed what he believed God when he told him he was going to, uh, he uh, be a father. Okay, now Dale, you're online with me, and we talked about this the other day, and I want to clarify something about what I said at that point in time. See that the the problem is. When you get, if you believe that he was saved when he was left the Earth of the Cal, uh, land of the Earth of the Chaldees, well, when he when he gets to the point where he's where God's telling him you're going to have a child, he's already saved. So the question, when God says he counted it to him for righteousness, are we talking about positional righteousness? Or are we talking about about experiential righteousness? And when I was talking to Dale about this, I was pointing out that in that in the the Romans passage, and there's another passage when you're he counted to him for righteousness. This is this is misunderstood as being experiential righteousness. But I think that he's talking about. And here's the issue: when you when you if Paul is quoting the Old Testament, I, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to think: if Paul is quoting an Old Testament passage. 
And the question then is if he is quoting a passage of scripture in in his lifetime, and he's quoting something out of the Old Testament, what is the interpretation that you should give what he is what he is what he is saying today when he's quoting the Old Testament? What is the interpretation you should make of that passage? Should you just dream up one for the one in Romans? Or should it mean the same thing it meant back there in, in Genesis or an earlier passage? See, the idea is the, the word of God needs to be interpreted in the way it was intended to be interpreted when it was written. So Paul was actually, he was actually quoting an Old Testament passage. And in that passage, when God counted to him for righteousness, if he didn't save him back there in, in, um, uh, in the Earl of, land of the Earl of the Chaldees, then it's positional righteousness when he got saved. At the, in other words, this is the, this is the moment of his salvation, okay? So I'm indicating that when you pe people read that Romans passage and one other passage that says the same thing, you have to understand he's not talking about experiential righteousness. He's talking about the fact that he got saved at that moment in time, okay? Now, notice here again, Abraham became spiritually saved after he was circumcised, and at that point in time, he becomes a new, uh, a, a new, yes, a new spiritual species because he's saved. He's a new species of race. He's a racial species when when he uh, when he became a Jew when he became circumcised. But now he's a new racial species, a new spiritual species uh, at this point in time when he believes in Christ. Now, sixth point is Abraham then bore children. Baby boys were uncircumcised at birth. When you're born, you're born uncircumcised, okay? So baby boys then were circumcised on the eighth day. And let me go back here. Baby boys were circumcised on the eighth day, and I indicated what, what that was. It has to do with the coagulation of blood. That's the way God made man. And at the time, at the time of the circumcision, the baby boy became part of the new species. He became a Jew. Now, let's learn some deeper meaning of circumcision in the following verses. In Romans 8, 28, now we're in the Pauline epistles. In Romans 8, 28, Paul is talking to these Romans about Jews. And he said, now, now let's do this slow enough for, for the for the statement to resonate with you as we're reading it. For he is not a Jew. Now, I put that word true in there because it is implied, okay? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Now, if you are an outward Jew, what do you, what do you think, what is he talking about there? To be an outward Jew. Circumcised, that's the ritual of circumcision. It's exactly, see, outwardly you are a Jew. And what Paul is saying to you, for he is not a true Jew who is one outwardly. And I want to I want to make a comment to you. We're talking today about uh, about Israel. There's much to do about Israel. OK, now our president today has and this is just a, a statement, a side effect here. Our president said today that that his relationship and our relationship under his administration is the best it has ever been in all of the history of our country, okay? Now, now what you need to understand, though, is this. <clears throat> th those people who live there are called Jews. Paul says, for he is not a true Jew who is one outwardly. Question, do you believe that these Jews over there, the males are circumcised? Do you think, you think they're still circumcising children? Yeah, they are. No, that's it. They are still worshiping. See, they are still worshiping under, under the Mosaic law. So these people are still circumcising their children, but we need to, under, and this is why I'm doing this, for you to understand that for he is not a true Jew who is one outwardly. Now, in the age of grace, the only thing that can help a Jew is to, be, is to believe in Jesus and become a Christian. You follow that? But when you get into the tribulation again, you're going to go back to the Mosaic law and they're going to have, they'll still be circumcising their kids. But guess what? During the tribulation, 
you got this you got this horrible war going on, one world government, the Antichrist comes, wants to take over, and Jesus comes back and shuts the whole mess down, okay? So the issue, and when they go out of the fifth cycle of discipline on three occasions, they went out, they were all circumcised. They had the ritual, but they didn't, they weren't circumcised in their heart, okay? So Paul says then, for he is not a true Jew. So we may call these people Jews over there, but they're not a true Jew, okay? Not a true Jew. For he is not a for he is not a true Jew who is one outwardly, simply because he's been circumcised. Now watch this, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. So while you're talking about circumcision, so when 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 Abraham was circumcised, that was the first. That was the first part. In other words, there, there's a two-step process here. First of all, you get circumcised in your flesh. Then you get circumcised in your heart. Otherwise, circumcision in your flesh is nothing. It's, no, it's not worth anything. And that's why Paul says, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. So circumcision has more meaning than just circumcising the, uh, the male foreskin. But he says in verse 29, but he is a Jew, this is the true Jew, he is the true Jew who is one inwardly. So back in, back in the, in the pre-Christian time, in the pre-age of grace, if you were going to be a true Jew, it's not because you're circumcised, it's because you're circumcised and you're, you have circumcised your heart, you're living by the plan that God gave you in it, as the Israelites. Okay, I think it's a fantastic passage. It has application today for all people who are oh, whatever. We're we're all uh, we're all hepped up about Israel. Well, wait a minute, it's the people who are the true Jews that are the issue. For he is not a true Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a true Jew who is one inwardly. That means ritual circumcision accompanied with reality, which is the circumcision of the heart. Now watch this, Steve. I want you. To, I want you all look at the bottom. Look at the bottom of page two. <clears throat> you see that word inwardly on the left hand column. See the word inwardly. Okay. Now watch. Let's read what is in the bracket. We're going to talk about a Jew who is inwardly. That is the Jew who is who has the ritual circumcision. You know what that is, accompanied with reality, and reality is circumcision of the heart. Now watch this. There's a there's a semi there's a colon there, which indicates that we're going to explain what circumcision of the heart is. Circumcision of the heart is ex first of all you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. See that's why we looked at three, three different, a process of a threefold process, of adjusting to the righteousness of God. The first thing you have to do is get saved. But I've indicated to you that the, the Christian way of life is not over. When you get saved, it has just begun. And that same thing is true of the true Jew. Uh, the true Jew. Ritual circumcision accompanied with reality, which is circumcision of the heart, accepting Christ for spiritual salvation, plus purging the heart of false doctrine by believing metabolized doctrine. So, a tr so the, the idea here then is the true Jew is one who's been circumcised outwardly and had been circumcised in the heart by taking in the word of God and making the application to the circumstances of life. Then he goes on in verse 29 and says, and circumcision of the heart, that's divine viewpoint replacing human viewpoint in the right lobe, and circumcision of the heart. Now watch this. This is amazing. And circumcision of the heart <clears throat> He says, by the Spirit, by the Spirit, and that means by means of the Holy Spirit's ministries, teaching, bearing witness, and confirming. Listen to me. Circumcision of the heart. Let me ask you a question. Circumcision of the heart. What are you doing? If you're circumcising your heart, you're getting rid of what? Human viewpoint, and you're, you're, you're uh, supporting it or supplying what? Divine viewpoint, that's exactly right. And how how are you doing that? See, circumcision of the heart 
and it's telling you how to circumcise your heart. It's by the Spirit. How the Spirit, how's this, what kind of an influence the Holy Spirit have on you when you're metabolizing doctrine? Well, first of all, he's going to teach you. He's going to bear witness that this is the way it is. He's going to confirm that truth so that you'll know that that's what it is, so you can believe it and and place it in your in your um, vocabulary, category, storage areas, put it on your in your uh, norms and standards, and on the launching pad for application. So circumcision of the heart by means by means of the spirit. Now watch by means of the spirit. This is the way you circumcise your heart by means of the spirit not by the letter. In other words, you do it by what the Holy Spirit's going to give you, not by going back and living by the Mosaic law. And his, the true Jew, and his praise, now watch this, and his praise, and that word praise means approval. Now stop here. I want you to think with me about something. This guy, this person now, has circumcised his heart, He's listening to what the Spirit of God is teaching him. As the pastor teacher teaches, the Holy Spirit makes it real for you. You believe it. So you're circumcising your heart by means of the Spirit, not by the letter. You're not, you're not going through some, some process of just, oh, do this, do that, don't do this. Now watch this. And his praise, the true Jew whose heart has been circumcised, his praise is not from people. Oh, Steve, I'm so proud of you. Cody, I, you, you can't believe how proud I am of you. Oh, listen, I think I'm just going to elevate you into a brand new position because you're doing so well. Janet, I want to give you, I want to give you much more than what you have now because you're doing so well. No, it's not by praise of people. And his praise is not from people, not from mankind, but the true Jew's approval is from God. Now, what happens is, see, people are going to come along and want to give you a medal. People are going to come, want to come along and give you some kind of a bonus. They're going to come around and give you, oh, wow, that's really wonderful. No, the truth of the matter is, what we need is God's approval. And what that means is his approval when you're doing something out here and you're living in this swamp today and everything seems to be going, you're happy, you're rejoicing, you're pleased, you're, you're, you're not in the dumper. You're not, you're belly aching. Why? It's because your approval is coming from God. Why? Because you're doing the right thing and God has made provision for you. That's the issue. So the true Jew is not going to get his approval from mankind. Oh yeah. Wow. You go to, you go to, you know, you go to temple five times a week or something like that. No, 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 no. Your approval comes from God. The Chaldeans are not beating, not whipping you. You're not going out on the fifth cycle of discipline. Your land is being blessed. You're getting rain when you're when your farmers plant, etc. Okay. Now, in Jeremiah six ten, it says and following, and the Lord speaking now. The Lord speaking to the Jews, the physical seed of Abraham. He's speaking to the physical seed of Abraham. Now, speaking through Jeremiah, and here's what happens. He says, to whom shall I communicate doctrine? Now, why is he, he's, it's not as though he's looking around saying, well, I wish somebody would show up here. Uh, I, I got this fantastic message that I'm waiting to give somebody. And there's nobody around. No, Steve, there's somebody around, <coughs> the mold around, but nobody wants what the communicator has to say. That's the idea. So he says, to whom shall I communicate doctrine? There's no positive vision. To whom shall I give a warning that they will listen? It's not that he's. It's not that he couldn't give a warning. He said, "To whom shall I give a warning that they will listen?" In other words, what he's looking for is a group of people or somebody he can give this warning to and say, "Wow, I buy that. Yeah, I receive that." And you do what you need to do so you don't get blasted by God. To whom shall I give a warning that they will listen? Again, no positive vision. Okay, we're going to change the table, folks. Thank you so much. Okay, buddy. To whom shall I give a warning that they will listen? Then he says, Behold, now watch this. He can't find any dog. He can't find anyone who will listen and take the warning. 
he said, behold their ears and their, um, behold their ears. Who is there? That's the physical seed of Abraham. These are Jews who have been circumcised, but they, they've been circumcised ritually, but they've, been not, they've not been circumcised of heart. So he said, behold, their ears are uncircumcised. Their ears are uncircumcised. Now, what do you think they're, an uncircumcised ear is? Tell me in your own words, what do you think an uncircumcised ear is? What? Okay. That's exactly right. See, they're not listening. So, again, he, he says, behold, their ears are uncircumcised. In other words, we need to need to get in there and punch a hole in that thing so let, let something get, get into here, okay? Behold, their ears are uncircumcised. They will not listen. Behold, the word of the Lord has become a reproach to them. I don't want to hear that. Now watch this. Behold, the word of the Lord has become a reproach to them. Now I put in bracketed here, this is the uncircumcised circumcised. Can you explain that to me? The uncircumcised circumcised. That's right. See, they're, they're physically circumcised, but they're spiritually not circumcised. Their heart is not open to the word of God. So what happens is they're circumcised physically, but spiritually their ears are closed. They're not listening. Their eyes are, their eyes are shut, okay? Then he goes on to say, let's see, they, the uncircumcised circumcised, they have no delight in it. What is it? It's the word of the Lord. They have no delight in the word. Now, when this happens, when these circumcised people are not circumcised in their heart, their ears are uncircumcised, their eyes are uncircumcised, guess what? God began the, the cycle of this. Their attention, okay? Jeremiah 9, 25. Behold, the days are coming, decrees the Lord. I will punish you. I will punish all who are circumcised and yet uncircumcised. Listen to that again. The days are coming, decrees the Lord, that I will punish all who are circumcised and yet uncircumcised, okay? He says, all who are circumcised. What does that mean? What? Physical circumcision. And yet, while they're physically circumcised, they're uncircumcised. What's that? Spiritual. So what's, the, what's their problem? What's that? Lack of doctrine. And why do they lack doctrine? Why do they lack doctrine? They're rejected. they're rejected. They're negative. So the question is, can you now explain circumcised yet uncircumcised? I believe you can. See, we've just done that. In Deuteronomy 10, 16, Moses said, so circumcise your heart. I mean, all the way back to Moses. He tell him, look, folks, circumcise your heart. And how are you going to do that? By metabolizing doctrine. And do not stiffen your neck any longer. What's that mean? Stop rejecting doctrine. So circumcise your heart and do not stiffen your neck any longer. That was a warning. Acts 7.51. Stephen. He says, you men. These, men are, these are men who are circumcised. This is Stephen speaking. Stephen, at this point in time, is a Messianic Jew. He's a believer. He's a follower of Christ. He said, you men, you are stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and ears. These are the people that, these are the people that are getting ready to, to stone him. You're stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart. You are always resting, resisting the Holy Spirit. You're doing just as your fathers, your ancestors did, rejecting Christ and rejecting sound doctrine. Jeremiah 4, 4. Circumcise your health, yourselves to the Lord. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Now, watch, listen to this. Let's go back. Let's go back and take a look at the three adjustments that have to be made to the righteousness of God. The first adjustment, if you're an unbeliever, the first adjustment is you have to do what? What? Believe what? 
believe the gospel. So you have to get saved. Now that you're saved, what's the second adjustment you have to make? If you're out of fellowship, what do you got to do? Break from recovery. But you're now you're in fellowship with God. What do you got to do? Take it in, take it in the Word of God and, and apply it. That's exactly right. So in Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy, uh, no, it's in uh, let's see in Jeremiah four four. Circumcise yourselves unto the Lord, and what is and remove the foreskins of your heart. Okay, that means their brains clogged up. Okay, then they need to they need to circumcise that thing. So if you have foreskins in your heart, what do you have to do? You got to circumcise it. This is figuratively speaking. Okay. Circumcise yourself, the Lord, and remove the foreskins of your heart. Be positive to sound doctrinal teaching. Then he's talking. He says, men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. He says, or else, because he's talking about you better circumcise this thing, or else my wrath will spread like fire and burn with no one to, uh, with no one to quench it of the evil disobedience of God to Israel. Deuteronomy 36, Moses said, moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your, now listen, I like this, moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the hearts of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul so that you may live that means survive as a client nation to God. Well, we've seen a lot here about circumcision and uh, perhaps should have a better idea of what this is. And, and I'm, I'm gonna Philippians 3, 3 in a minute. But when I go back and talk, talk about something here again, review the terms, ritual circumcision, spiritual circumcision, reality of circumcision, new, new racial species, those terms are important to us. Now let's let's pick up with uh, with uh, Philippians three three. In this in this passage, it says, Paul says, "For we are the true circumcision." Now let me point out something here. This is not going to. Uh, I'm going to say it this way. It's not going to be easy to understand what Paul's saying here. Because if, if if I were just to say, for we are the true circumcision, who is Paul talking about? I'm going to raise that question in a minute. Don't want, don't want you to answer it yet. He said, for we are the true circumcision, comma, who worship in spirit, who worship in the spirit of God and take pride in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. I've given you the Greek word structure there and giving you a title of what we're going to, what we're going to learn from this verse 3 the royal family's true circumcision based upon the concept of mutilation he told us in the previous verse uh, something about this mutilation about this circumcision now watch what he says the true the royal family's true circumcision based upon the concept of mutilation from verse 2, the previous verse, we had this phrase, beware of the mutilation. That was the third phrase that was, in, that was back there. Beware of the mutilation. Here's a truism. It means it's true. Physical circumcision was regarded as mutilation when the meaning of physical circumcision was distorted to represent a spiritual factor. In other words, what it amounts to you get you get circumcised as a male Jew, and you know that you're you're a uh, you're a new species, but the truth of the matter is you think this is this is a spiritual reality. You this you are now a spiritual person simply because you were circumcised. That's like believing today. We as Christians believing today that we're spiritual simply because we rebound. That's not so. So physical circumcision was re regarded as mutilation when the meaning of physical circumcision was distorted to represent a spiritual factor. In other words, yeah, I'm circumcised, but hey, this is a spiritual thing for me. I'll look where I am now, you know, I'm so, this guy here. 
But the truth of the matter is no, no, it's not. Physical circumcision alone <coughs> is simply a ritual and not spiritual. So if I ask you, physical circumcision, is that a spiritual deal? Does that make does that make them more spiritual because they're circumcised? The answer is no, no. So here's what Paul says. For we are the true circumcision. I've given you the, the Greek words there and what they mean. And when you read that phrase, for we are the true circumcision, Paul is the one who's doing the speaking. The word for there is a word that actually indicates that Paul is about to explain something very important to you and me as members of the royal family of God. For, this is, Paul's indicating, hold on now, getting ready to tell you something, something is important. Well, what's he going to say? He said, for we. Now, the interesting thing here is that that word we there, hamis, this is, this is an emphatic use. In other words, when you see that word, it is used as a pronoun. It's a pronoun, but it's used in an emphatic sense in this verse, meaning we and only we. So it's not we and a bunch of other people now. It's we and only we. So what we have to know is who we are. Who is we? This is the emphatic use of the pronoun we. We does not refer to, the, to every royal family member. See, Paul is talking to the Philippians. These are people basically that, are, that have reached spiritual adulthood. These are, these are spiritually mature believers. So you might believe when Paul said, for we are the true circumcision, he'd be talking about Christians, okay? But don't, don't go there yet, just yet, because that's not what he's saying. He said, for we are the true circumcision, we is emphatic. It does not refer to every member of the royal family of God, simply because we're royalty. No, that's not who we, who we is. We, in point number three, we refers to Paul and some other people. We is not every born-again Christian in the age of grace. Oh, for we, yeah, we are the true circumcision. No, who is the, re the real circumcision? It's Paul and some other people, but the question is, who are the some other people? Point four. We specifically rose, refers only to royal family members who meet the three conditions of true circumcision found in the remaining phrases in verse three. So here's what we're saying, Marshall. When Paul says, for we are the true circumcision, the question is, who is we? Okay? And it's Paul and any other royal family member who is worshiping in of God, taking pride in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. That's three things there. So we are not we are not the true circumcision because we are royal family. Because there are many royal family members who are saved, but they have not circumcised their heart. And if you're truly circumcised, you have become a born-again Christian. You are living in fellowship with God through the use of Operation Recovery. And you're metabolizing and applying the Word of God. Now you are true circumcision, and it's manifested in this way. We are the true circumcision. Here it is. Who is that? Who worship in the Spirit of God, take pride in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. So the truth of the matter is, you may be saved. But if you're not worshiping in the spirit of God, and you know what? Well, we're going to see what that means. Worshiping in the spirit of God. We have to know what it means to worship. And we have to make sure that when we know what worship is and we're doing it, you need to be doing it in the spirit, in the fear of the spirit, in the sphere of the spirit, and not in the sphere of the flesh. So we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God, take pride in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. Remember, angelic conflict. Steve, this is a protocol plan. 
It's a rigid, long-established code prescribing complete deference to superior rank and authority, et cetera, okay? A precisely correct procedure. So let's look at this. Um, we're gonna, we, we've done through all the way down. No, we need to come to the word R, number three. For oh uh, no let no I went I've, I've missed uh, missed a point here let's go back to point four point four we specifically refers only to royal family members who meet the con true circumcision found in the remaining three phases of this verse we who worship in the spirit of God we who take pride in Christ Jesus and we who put no confidence in the flesh suppose Marshall suppose it was just we who take pride in Christ Jesus. Who we who put no confidence in the flesh, but we don't have who worship the spirit in the spirit of God. It's, it's not right. <clears throat> you are not true circumcision unless you're doing all three. Not just two, not one, all three. Point five said this is why God the Father keeps us alive under the principle of living grace. Living grace. Living grace is we're going to define living grace. As the, as the temporal provision of God for you so you could be alive in, this, in the angelic conflict. That's living grace. So living grace is God the Father's life. Here's the truism. We're alive only by God the Father's provision of living grace one second at a time. <laughs> now, he says, for we are, for he's going to explain something to us. He's going to explain who is the true circumcision. We, we found out that we is not all, all born again Christians. It's we who are doing these three things. Worshiping in the spirit of God, taking pride in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh. So God's keeping us alive. So he says, for we are, we are. And that, the, the grammatical construction of that word are means keep on being. For we keep on being. Well, what does that in indicate grammatically? This indicates what may be expected of royal family members who are true circumcision. So here, listen to this. If each one of you in this room, if each one of you online with me tonight, right now, if each one of you online, you are true circumcision, then it is expected of you, not, not that you are supposed to do this, it's expected of you that you are already doing this, that you are, keep, you keep on being, you keep on being something. And what do you keep on being? The question is, keep on being what? So when we say, for you, for we are the true circumcision, we're going to find out what keep on being really is. We'll answer that soon. We are the circumcision. And that word circumcision, there are means the true circumcision, and it's described, true circumcision is described in the next three phrases. We've already done that. What is true circumcision? Okay, let's break those three phrases down. First of all, it's those who worship, and that phrase is translated correctly, but let's talk about worship in your life. To worship is a function of the royal priesthood. You are a royal priest. Now, the royal ambassador is not worshiping. The, the, new, the royal ambassador is ministering. He's carrying out his ministerial duties. But as a royal priest, you are representing yourself before God. You are worshiping in that sense. So those who worship, worshiping is actually a function of the royal priest. You are a royal priest, so you meet part of the, if you're doing the rest of this, um, grammatically, this word, the phrase who worship, this word is a pictorial present tense, which presents to, a mind, to the mind a picture of an event in the process of occurring. See, that's why you keep on being. This It's already, it's already occurring, okay? The event in the process of occurring is worshiping God from within the sphere of the spirit. This is the problem. You're to keep on doing this. You are to keep on worshiping in the sphere of the spirit. Guess what? When you're out of fellowship with God, you're a carnal believer. You are not in the sphere of spirit. You're not worshiping no matter how many times you go to church, okay? No matter how many songs you sing, no how much you pray. 
So this word is a pictorial present indicating a, a, it brings to mind a picture of an event that's in the process of occurring. The event in the process of occurring is worshiping God from the, from within the sphere of the spirit and the believer who represents true circumcision produces this action of worship worshiping on a consistent basis. It's not a hit and miss kind of thing. It's on a consistent basis. And as the believer continues to worship in this manner continually, he or she will advance to the objective. And what is the objective? Super grace alpha. That's the first level of spiritual adulthood. Then you're going to advance to super grace bravo. And then you're going to go on to ultra super grace, which is maximum spiritual maturity. And you do this by keep on worshiping in the spirit of God. Sub point two, the universal, royal, the universal royal priesthood, which means every born again Christian is a royal priest. The universal priesthood of the believer, plus the fact that every believer in the age of grace is part of the royal family of God, we are spiritual aristocracy, implies unique form of worship during the age of grace. Steve, what is the unique form of worship? In the spirit of God, in the sphere of the spirit. That's unique. It didn't happen in prior, in prior ages. Now, let's talk about that phrase, in the spirit of God. This in the spirit of God actually indicates that this is God, the Holy Spirit, in the spirit of God. We're talking about worshiping in the Holy Spirit of God. It also indicates that worship is accomplished within this sphere, in the sphere. Worship is accomplished in this sphere. So the question is this, ladies, if you're, if you're in the flesh, are you actually worshiping God? No, you have to worship where? In the God, and you worship in the spirit of God if you don't know how to get there. And this is part of the problem today. It's Operation Cry. Romans 6, 6, 6, 11, and 6, 13. It's not just rebound. Quite, you know, we use that term rebound. Rebound means something else to somebody else. We've used it. I've just continued to use it. It's really confession of sin. You need to be confessed up to date. And then functioning in Operation Cry, no reckon, reckon, and yield. And when you do that, the fourth step of that, yield to, yield to God the Holy Spirit, you're in now you're ready, to, you're worshiping when you're in there, okay? Sub point three, the sphere of all worship is the sphere of the spirit. So is there any form of worship that can, that can, that can be accomplished? Any form of legitimate worship, is there any form that can be accomplished outside the sphere of the spirit? The answer is no. But if you don't know how to get there, how can you worship in the spirit? So do you remember, can you realize now when we're talking about the Angela conflict, a protocol plan, a precisely correct procedure, can you now look at what's happening in every church across this country and how, how few of them are worshiping in the sphere of the spirit because they don't know how to get there? I'm not being critical here. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be objective to show you why we are in the mess we're in today. So this that leads to spiritual worship that leads to advance must be accomplished within the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. When necessary, on page six, when necessary, and prior to a time of worship, when necessary, when necessary, and prior to a time of worship, the mechanics of entering the sphere of the spirit for the purpose of worship is operation recovery, rebound plus operation cry. That is the means of getting back in the sphere of the spirit. Function with the sphere of the spirit is necessary for all biblical forms of worship. If we're going to worship God, we have to be in the sphere of the spirit. As a result of worship within the sphere of the spirit, we have the final two phrases. So because you are functioning in the sphere of the spirit, you're going to be able to take pride in Christ Jesus, and you're also going to be um, you're also going to be able to put no confidence in the flesh. See, that's the last phrase. 
but we're going to be out of time. We, we matter of fact, we got nine seconds left. So let's just un let's understand this then. This point seven on page five, on page six, the seventh point says, as a result of worship within the sphere of the spirit, we have these two final phrases, and take pride. See, because you're worshiping in the sphere of the in the sphere of the spirit, you're able to take pride in Christ Jesus, and you're able to have no confidence in your flesh. So when we come back on, not Sunday now, we've got to have a new message for Sunday, but when we come back next Wednesday, we'll pick up with these last two things and show this idea of worshiping by taking pride in Christ Jesus and having no confidence in the flesh. Let me ask a question before we close, though. Let me have your mind now. I want your mind. When this says, for we, too, we are the true circumcision, we are the true circumcision, true circumcision. Who's Paul talking about? For we are the true circumcision. He's talking about royal family only? Is that what he's talking about? Okay, How? but every royal family member? No, not every royal family member. What it, it's, who is, who is the true circumcision? Those trip in the spirit and take pride in Christ Jesus and put no pride, no confidence in the flesh. That describes who is the true circumcision? Question. Are all Christians truly circumcised? The answer is no. Do you know why now? Okay, thank you. Father, thank you for this magnificent lesson again tonight. Um, Sunday was tough for me to teach it because there was so much information there. And uh, we're able to pull, this, pull some of that back in here tonight again. And take a look. Now, here's the issue, Father. If we're going to want to know what's going on in this country and why it is in the mess that it's in right now, just ask yourself this question. Not at, not, we're not asking you to answer it, Father. We've already done that. But we need to answer this question. If we, if we indicated, if we have indicated that if we are Christians, we need to act like it. Can we really act like a Christian if we're not truly circumcised? The answer is no. So if conflict is resolved through people getting saved because of the lifestyle of born-again Christians who should be living the Christian way of life, we might now better understand why there is so much pressure in this country today, why we're burning up in Arkansas, why somebody else got too much water somewhere else, why somebody else got something else going on there. The various means by way you get by which you get our attention that something is wrong with our Christian lives. Father, we come, Father, we come to you tonight in humility. We're not, we're not being arrogant. We're proclaiming your truth. You're the one that gave us this truth, and this is what we proclaim. So we shouldn't crucify the, the communicator because he's communicating the word of God, but yet that's what happens. Big deal. That's their problem, not ours. We're going to continue to teach the truth, but we first need to learn it. We can teach it and live it. I thank you for every person that's logged on tonight. And I, Father, I have no idea what happened with Facebook tonight. He's like the devil got involved. But it's going to be out. It's going to be out there on. Um, it'll be out there in in WebEx, and it'll be able to be put up in YouTube to get later. So thank you, Father, for this message tonight. In Christ's name, Amen.